Okay. Critique of Relativism by Stace, the philosopher. Stace starts out by summarizing that moral, uh, summarizing moral relativism in general. That's what he does in the first paragraph. Would someone like to summarize in a similar fashion uh, moral relativism for us? Emily. Okay, I, mean, I can take a whack at it, but he was kind of talking about that like, it's not like a good thing because like you and I could have different like moral standards and like the moral relativism. Like I could think, I think he said it later, but just about like the tribes, like one of them thinks that cannibalism is okay. One of them thinks that burning sacrifices is okay, but like someone else doesn't. And so like, if you have that, then there's no way to like be on the same page or like punish anyone. Cause like you could just be like, Oh, but like, that's what I believe. And then the cops are like, well, that's not what I believe. And then you're just stuck. Yeah. You, you jumped right into the critique of it, but we're just trying to summarize it in general first here. Um, you're oh, right. Was like, well, part of his critique, but that was not how he summarized. He summarized it right at the very beginning. Celia. Um, each culture has their own moral standard that is right in its own sense because you can't like deny that. Yes, that's, that's correct. Um, that, and that's what moral relativism states, that morality changes from culture to culture uh, and that each culture has its own set moral standard. Um, when I say set, I don't mean in an absolute sense, but in a way that, that that's just generally what's accepted. And that is the moral relativist position. It's not actually all that complex of a position and that's been the position that I've been arguing for here for the last, um, a week and a half or two weeks. Okay, next question. Um, Stace makes a distinction about what is thought to be right, which changes, and that which is right changing. Can someone explain that distinction? This distinction about that Stace makes about what is thought right changing versus what is right changing. Celia. Um, so for the relativist, what is thought to be right is what is right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And? It becomes that. And, yeah. What does the absolutist think? Uh, that what you think is right does not determine necessarily what is right, that there is a universal standard that is possible. Right, and um, what does Stace, what point does Stace make about those who claim that what is right changes? Remember what he, what he says? I don't remember. Uh, he says, that is a very, very startling assertion. So if you're gonna be taking notes here uh, on Stace, could be useful. You could do this in your, um, in your course packs. There's space in there. You can, you can summarize Stace in there, or you can do this in your notes, or you can just hope for the best. Any of those things works. Um, but I think that, uh, that having record of this is probably um, pretty valuable. Uh, the first point, that Stace makes is this. Look, everyone believes that what is thought right changes. Like that's not a shock. And the fact that someone like Benedict is gonna spend an entire book talking about different cultures is again, not particularly surprising. Everyone already knows that. In fact, if everyone did agree in right and wrong, would we even have a field that was called ethics? Like seriously, would we bother with that? No, it'd be obvious, it's not obvious. And this is why we have um, ethicists trying to figure out what is right and wrong. And just because people don't agree about something, it is very startling, our author suggests, to assert that there is nothing that's right because people don't agree, then there isn't anything that's right or, or, or these things do change. Um, next question. Can somebody explain the two meanings of the word standard that Stace uses? He uses the word standard and uses it in a couple different ways. Ian. Uh, there is the absolute standard which applies universally 
which defines what is right and wrong, and there is a cultural standard which locally defines what is culturally acceptable and good. And Ian, why are relativists mentally lazy? Because they would deny the existence of an absolute standard, of an absolute moral standard. Yeah, because they oftentimes, just as you guys might have been doing over the last couple of weeks, accidentally slipping into this belief that because people don't agree about morality, there's no such thing as an absolute morality, right? And our, how many of you enjoyed the fact that our author was kind of ornery and mocked people? How many of you caught his sarcasm, like towards the end, he's sarcastic for a whole paragraph. He's ranting about relativists being great empiricists. It's funny. I enjoy him being such an ornery, ornery author. Um, yeah, so uh, Ian, you're right, and you're right again. Okay, so uh, the, the discussion goes something along the lines of this. Um, we have a phrase here, and let's go back to what we learned previously in logic, right? We have a phrase here, there is no universal standard, there is no universal standard. But even though the words are exactly the same, there is a sense of ambiguity here, right? In which sense is the word or phrase universal standard meant? You see, there's two possible meanings of the phrase universal standard. It's true that there is no universal standard, but it's not true that there is no universal standard. That is the position of the absolutist. And the term universal standard has two different meanings, potentially. The relativist is mentally lazy because they fail to see that there are two different standards being used here. Ian, you're laughing. I mean, I think you're right, but I think it's funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I mean, keep in mind, this is not my language. This is, uh, this is Stace's language, which I think is uh, quite, quite good. Let's, uh, let's change this ever so slightly. And this is a point that I would bring out here in the argument more than Stace would. But we've talked quite a bit about um, about this type of thing when we were talking about logic. To put it slightly differently, there is little agreement about what is right or wrong across cultures. And frankly, even that point isn't really a very good point. Um, it depends, of course, how one interprets what is viewed and believed across cultures. There may be some uh, cultures that are fairly small um, and, and kind of strange, like maybe the Dobuin culture. Did you guys also notice the sarcasm that uh, Stace uses when he's like, apparently we're to take all moral lessons in the future from the Dobus. Um, I thought that was funny. Uh, but, but, but maybe, the, but in reality, there's actually a lot of agreement across cultures about what's right now. Believe it or not, there is. But even if we're take, to take the relativist interpretation, let's do so, let's go there. Fine, there's little agreement about what's right and wrong across cultures. To put it slightly differently, there's no certainty about right and wrong. Therefore, there is no objective right and wrong. This is a fallacy. Um, to put it, to use an analogy here uh, in something that you might be more familiar with because you've heard it before, um, here's, here's a similar type of fallacy. People, uh, it's, the same it's the same fallacy, but a, a, a slightly, different, um, slightly different usage. Um, because people disagree about, uh, you know, who the true God is, no true God does exist. What fallacy is this, guys? Hey, I'll give you a point if you can guess the right one. Time for an extra point. Because people disagree about something, it's not real. Which starts one was with that? An I, right? What was that, Celia? It, it starts with an I, right? I, yeah. Like incorrect cause, like something about the cause? No, it's not false cause. When I, said, when I said I, I was, I was speaking like a pirate. That's like, I, R, yes, that's a, it's a yes. It does start with an I. Anna. Irrelevant conclusion. Nope. Irrelevant. Uh. Close. The no cigar. 
probably can't say cigar anymore. We're in Oregon. They're going to tax those. Ian. Ignorance. Yeah, you're right. Ignorance. Ignorance is the one that says, you know, um, hey, we don't know about life on Mars. If there's life on Mars, so there isn't any, right? People disagree about this, so there isn't, it isn't true. And this is largely the main appeal of relativism, is it not? That's the main psychological appeal. Hey, look, people can't agree on this. Therefore, there isn't any such thing. Because isn't that really what the relativist is saying here? To go back to this language, the relativist asserts and must assert rather than assume that there is no second usage here, universal standard. Okay, so let's look at the argument very, very quickly here that I think is essential um, and maybe even a slightly, well, feel free to disagree with me, but I think this is a better way to put it and a more direct way to put it than Stace does. Relativism must assert rather than assume that there is no universally applicable standard, right? And that's what they claim. If you're a relativist, you say there is no universally applicable standard. People have different standards and it's all fine for them. It's not simply implied because people disagree. On the other hand, absolutism is also an assertion that there is an, a, a universally applicable standard, that that universally applicable standard does in fact exist. And both of these must assert rather than assume that position. And so this, in a sense, places absolutism and relativism on the same exact footing. But what it does do is it denies relativism's main appeal, which is really based on the fallacy of ignorance. But there is an emotional appeal there. And so right there, the main appeal of relativism should be destroyed for you. You should say, oh, just because people disagree about things doesn't mean that there isn't, it isn't a thing. Okay. And this is where uh, Stace leaves his first argument. Then he goes into section two, which uh, you're welcome. I chopped it out for you. You didn't have to read it. Section two was Stace's version of the argument in favor of ethical relativity. Chopped out of the course pack, you're welcome. Section three is the next section that you read. That's why in section three he says, now that we've looked at the argument in favor of ethical relativity, let's look at the argument against it. Okay. Um, and then we start looking at um, the, I think probably, well, I, let me first say, I think the first argument is good to knock relativism down a peg and put it kind of level of something else. Now let's ask the question, is it useful? Um, so here's the question. How does Stace use comparing moral standards um, across uh, cultures to show that moral relativism is not, um, is not a good system? It'll be in the second part of his uh, article. Once again, how does Stace use the comparison of different cultures um, to discuss uh, how moral relativism is not useful. Mm. Emily. Because he just, like, because he kind of talks about that, like, uh, that it's, like, impossible to do that just because, that, like, you can't compare, like, the social groups and just stuff like that. Yeah, you're exactly right. If relativism is, is correct, um, can we compare cultures? Uh, in any meaningful way? The answer is no, we can't. Yet we tend to think that we can. Um, and so can we compare the Nazi culture with say a Christian culture? Nope. How about the Christian culture that says love thy neighbor versus the cannibal culture that says eat thy neighbor? Nope. But we assume that such comparisons have meaning. Same thing would be true with different time periods, right? 
um, to say, is this time period a, a morally better time period? Is, has there been moral progress or moral disintegration? Um, we assume that those conversations have some meaning. Remember 160 years ago uh, when we had, uh, or 100 and, gee, what would it be? Yeah, 160 years ago when we had slavery in the United States, we abolished slavery. Is that a moral improvement? The relativists must say, eh, if they're being logical here, which is a struggle for relativists, let's face it. Logic and relativism, they don't really go together very often. It's kind of like a short circuit. Um, but anyway, oh, by the way, if you uh, have embraced relativism over the last couple of weeks, yes, I'm mocking you, um, in case you're wondering. Uh, yeah, so your brain short circuiting, like, ah, reason, yeah. Uh, can we compare, can we see that we've done better by abolishing slavery? Well, the answer for the relativists, if they want to be consistent, must be no. In fact, to really take it, you know, uh, where, where space does, the, the relativists, though, they don't want to draw your attention to this, would have to say, in a, if, if a culture defines what is morally right, then the Hindus were right to burn women alive on the funeral pyres of their dead husbands. They did this, by the way. Oop, husband died, time to light him on fire and throw his wife alive on top of him while he's burning. You guys know they did that? I think I remember That's learning that. Totally yeah. Right. Not only that, it, from the relativist perspective, right? Really, because you know whatever the culture says is, is right. Not only that, but the British were wrong to take their Christian ideals, step in there, and keep the women from being burnt alive. How many of you really want to go there and be like, yes, I'm a relativist. How dare those evil British stop the women from being burned to death? Okay. Um, and uh, this leads to the, the, the really the conclusion here in the first little section of a second argument which is if relativism is right, um, moral progress has no meaning. Or one set of mora uh, morals cannot be any better or worse than any other set of morals. Love thy neighbor, eat thy neighbor, meh. And then he says, that's not where the difficulties for the relativist end. They actually are much more complex than that. He says, so far we've been presupposing that social groups are definable. Okay, the question is, are social groups definable? He says, it's very difficult. Would somebody like to explain to the class the difficulty that, that Stace points out? Why is it very difficult to have uh, and, and to assert that a, a definable social cohesive group is possible. Um, let's go with uh, Anna. Because there's the groups overlap and there's like groups within groups and then like, there's like, you can't define them. Yeah, you're right, I like that. There are groups within groups, they overlap. Um, you know, so, so let's use the United States as an example. It, does the United States have one social group? Or are there multiple social groups? Okay, so then how do we define a, a social group? Well, how about we say, well, you've got this, the American Southerners, you know, down there in Alabama, that's one social group. And then you got the people up there in New York City, that's another social group. Then you've got the Oregonians, that's another social group. Really? Oregonians, one social group? Uh, yeah, Oregon's kind of weird in its own way, but I mean, um, do people in Baker City, Oregon, or Enterprise, or Joseph, or LeGrand, do they have anything in common with people in Portland? Pretty sure no one else in Oregon does, but... <laughs> yeah, well, that's Eugene. mostly true. I, I don't know. Uh, Eugene uh, and I would say Corvallis also have quite a bit in common with Portland. Um, you know, less burned out buildings, but whatever. Okay, that was bad. Anyway, um, go, yeah, go Ted Wheeler. Um, so uh, what's a social group? Okay, well, you, well, you say, okay, well, let's, let's boil it down to just Corvallis, right? Corvallis is, a, is Corvallis a single social group? 
Fenium Christian. Is that fitting well into the broader Corvallis culture? Nope. So let's break it down even more. Saniam culture. And you're like, well, there's one culture. How many of you have gone to one of your friend's houses and you've been around the, the people in their family and you realize that family has kind of different morals and values than you do, than your family does? Anyone ever notice that? Yeah, we all have. So which group is the group, right? Which social group is the social group? In fact, even in one family unit, do people 100% agree on morality? No! And so how can you claim that a social group defines the morality when you can't define a social group? You see the challenges there. And I mean, if you can't define a standard between different cultures, then how are you supposed to deter, like even if you determined within groups, what's the right way to define it? Like you can't define what is the right way because it's all relative. So you can't even technically literally divide anything. Yeah, exactly. And so the purpose of morality then is to say that there's no morality and give us absolutely no guidance on what, guidance on what we ought to do. Um, and so then, uh, yeah, so then uh, Stace leaves us with uh, only the individual then is left to define um, what is right and wrong. And this means that we can't even compare individuals, right? So you got Jesus and his morality. You got Mother Teresa and her morality. You got Hitler and his morality. And heck, let's throw in Ted Bundy, this serial rapist and murderer, too. Ted Bundy, Jesus, meh. Well, they both were doing what they thought were right. And this is really what um, Stace is arguing here. And this is why the focus on, on, on ethics, though it's difficult, to discern what the true absolute morality is. He says, we can't give up because this option is no option at all. It leads to moral chaos. Okay, so let's go back to presupposing that we can define a social group. Okay, so he does this. Let's go back and presuppose we can define a social group. If we can, uh, say that, that uh, say uh, uh, Portland is a social group. Um, what's the problem with that? Does someone want to explain? Um, I'm waiting for someone who hasn't spoken much yet. If they want to join, I'm going to move my screen over in case I'm not seeing everybody. Nope, I'm seeing everybody. Anybody who hasn't spoken yet? Anybody who hasn't spoken yet? Hey, leave your hand up. No. Okay. Uh, Crystal, is your hand up? No. All right, Celia, shoot. Christina, was your hand up? Celia. Well, I mean, having visited a Portland University, their big thing was diversity. And so they have a lot of everything. And so is there's not really one group in Portland? Yeah. So, well, I mean, that goes back to the, the, the group problem. Um, but even if you like absolutely assert that this is the group, the group is say Portland State. That is the that is the uh, group, right? That is the social group. Okay, well, fine. Then you look within that, and it turns out people uh, within that um, have different views. So, which view do you pick if you assert a social group on any um, pile of individuals? Like even Senior Christian, if we if we define, we say Senior Christian is a social group then it turns out that there are some moral issues that people still disagree on. So which group is right? Emily. Wouldn't you just have to go with the majority and just take that and then go from there? Because if you have a majority and then the other people just kind of have to suck up and be like, okay, well, like, I mean, even with elections, like it's majority vote and then the other sides have to suck it up. Yeah, you, you might have to go with the majority, but you see that still leads to moral problems, right? Because if the majority are Nazis, is that I mean, helpful? That's the issue. <laughs> or if if you don't go with the majority and you go with whoever's the strongest, like who can beat up on everybody else in order to assert the morality, is that good? I mean, whatever works, works. 
Yeah, except for that, the problem is it doesn't, right? So let's look at the Roman morality and Jesus. Who won? We would like to believe that Jesus won. However, others might say that the Romans won. I don't know. They crucified Jesus on a cross. And outside of being the son of God, which can kind of overcome that sort of thing, you know, he clearly lost. They killed him on a, on a tree. Looks like the Romans are right and Jesus' morality was wrong. You see, those are the problems with going with the majority or um, going with might. And then if you pick some minority to go with, so you've got the little group of uh, Jesus followers who are challenging the majority Roman culture. Um, who's to say that that has any more merit than anything else? There is nothing that says that that has more merit than anything else. And so when you have one person who comes along and says, you know what, I'm going to stand up for what is right. I'm going to fight the burning of widows. I'm going to fight racism. I'm going to stand up for truth and for justice and for honor. Is that any better than Ted Bundy raping women and killing them? I mean, really? So what happens to morality? What happens to like progress, to moral progress, to trying to do better? It dies a miserable death. It goes away. And so if we actually embrace relativism, where everyone is de defining their own truth, where everyone is defining their own morality and everyone's truth and everyone's morality is a little bit different. And there's nothing to say that one morality is any better or any worse than anybody else's. Then this will lead to the complete disillusion of society. And guys, moral relativism has been the most popular um, and the most common assumed moral system for my generation and for yours. Look around, what are we seeing? Like everyone's manipulating the truth and everyone's lying and everyone's going after a lot of power. Tolerance is being abolished by tolerance. To yeah, exactly. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so I would argue that a lot of the problems that we're seeing right now in culture has a lot to do with sort of a general embracing of what Pope Benedict, as you guys read, what Pope Benedict called the dictatorship of relativism. Could be. Believe it or not, I think that the bigger problems that we have in society uh, are, are rooted in, in the destruction of the family unit and uh, the uh, complete abolition of what we might call a, a natural law, but that's a different discussion. Okay, um, how many of you feel like you understand what was argued in the paper better now? Let me see your hands. How many feel like you understand what was being argued in the paper better now? How many of you are like, yeah, I got, I got nothing? Okay, so this will be um, online for you, um, the, the video and um, the, uh, the PowerPoint will also be there, I guess, or at least you'll be able to see half of it in a video online um, on your Google Classroom. So are there any questions before I let you all go? Very brief quiz, um, uh, reasonably brief quiz. It's called a test in your Google Classroom, but it's really more of a quiz over relativism. The case for and the case against, be able to attach the authors to their arguments, please. Um, and be familiar also with things like classical conditioning for that. It's gonna be a true false quiz on next Monday. So that's your homework to study and kind of get ready for, for that. If you feel you have any, uh, any questions, you wanna meet with me about something, be sure to send me an email and we'll set up a time. Okay, have a good rest of your day, guys.